to David, who said, I'll come over and then chat uh, or tell these guys a little bit about gravitational waves and what we're going through. And this is an amazing period of time for this field. So I'll kind of just go and scheme over several topics. And please stop me, ask questions, because really it's, not, it's an open-ended uh, kind of set of presentations here. Um, so whatever you are more interested, please just help me go where you want me to go. So the kind of the context is, I mean, all through our history, we've been learning about our universe. So first through electromagnetic waves, and you can imagine this old caveman was beginning to wonder what is that bright thing on the sky. Things got a lot more interesting um, around the 80s, when for the first time, we got, to we, got, we got to try and understand what was going on out there through multiple sources. So this supernova 1987A, also produced copious amount of neutrinos, a ton of energy came out in particles, uh, and we detected both of them. So not only did we get electromagnetic waves, but we also got particles from a very high energy, energetic event. And of course, the last one to join the crowd was gravitational waves. This happened just three years ago, even though uh, it took about 100 years from the theory that predicted to finally being able to detect them. So I'll try to walk you through a little bit of what is in store uh, in the future, but a little bit also going back, uh, looking back in the past as to what it took to get there, why it took so long, and some of the opportunities that um, are lying around. So as you all know, and we've been already discussing uh, general relativity with David, this is a theory that Einstein proposed in 1915, and it has many multiple consequences. It was very strange for the first time you, you, uh, he proposed that we should do away with the concept of forces, and now interactions are actually to be the tip, uh, imagined as causing curvature in the fabric of space-time, and that curvature is what determines where bodies uh, would move. And the earlier formula E equal mc squared also told us that any form of energy can be seen as having a, uh, a mass. So mass and energy curves space-time and of course, higher densities lead to stronger curvatures when you put that into the equations. And one of the things you can kind of quickly derive is that there are objects that are much, much more dense uh, than the sun, which uh, will curve more and more the space-time till a point where the space-time is so curved that nothing really can escape. If you compute the escape velocity uh, on the surface of an object and you think that object, or you regard this object more and more compact, there is a point at which the escape velocity will be equal to the speed of sun, the, this, uh, the speed of light. And given that we already know from special relativity that's the maximum speed we can, uh, we can have, at least within this theory, then an object like a black hole should exist, at least in, on paper. So people set out to try and get gravitational waves, but let's just look back as to one of the first kind of consequences of Einstein's theory of relativity, which was this uh, fact that as curves, as the space-time gets curved around a massive object, any trajectory will be uh, affected by it, uh, either by particles or by light, and in particular, the light uh, deflection by massive objects was a, a natural consequence. And very quickly after it, in fact, before, uh, the 19, uh, uh, before the theory was even finalized in 1915, there were missions out there trying to go and measure the deviation around uh, uh, this uh, sun eclipse of distant stars. Uh, distant stars. The, this efforts culminated in 1916 by Eddington, who actually detected the first deflection. But you can picture a little bit of what, would, what could have happened had he not measured what JR would have predicted. So one option would have been, you threw away with a theory, Einstein's theory of relativity would have been wrong. The alternative would have been, if you go and measure exactly what the theory predicts, not only do you kind of validate that theory at that regime, but now you have a tool to do astrophysics. So we now know, fast forward in the future, what is it that really happened. Uh, Eddington did measure what the theory predicted, and many, uh, many uh, missions afterwards uh, measure this effect much more accurately. And then we turn into an amazing tool to discover lots of things. And light bending has been used to discover dark matter, nowadays exoplanets, etc. 
So this is kind of what was before the detection of gravitational waves and even before the detection of, of the Higgs boson in the LHC. I was teasing my particle physicist friends. I said, well, if I have to put money in gravitational waves or the LHC, I would put money any time on gravitational waves before the LHC. Because one thing can happen when you go and look for the Higgs boson, the Higgs boson could be where you, where you want it or where you thought uh, it should be, in which case you learn nothing. You just gain much more confidence on your theory. The interesting thing is the other option, where you actually don't find it there, you find it elsewhere, which hints of new physics. With gravitational waves, we knew something would happen that in both cases you would win. If it is exact, if they were exactly spread in general activity, fine. That's not so good for pushing the limits of what we under understand uh, the theory of gravity should be. But on the other hand, we have this amazing new tool to do astrophysics. And as we go along, we'll try and see where is it that we are today, given the detections we have made so far? So the first thing, and this is to put things in context, is just imagine what kind of tests has general activity been put through prior to the detection of gravitational waves. And there are two typical length scales that you can think, or two typical measure uh, parameters you can think to, uh, to kind of govern or, or describe how strong gravitational effects one could be. One is an easy one. One is the gravitational potential of the objects. So essentially, you take the mass of any given object divided by the, its characteristic length, and then you have some kind of range. And sitting here, and at order one, is where a black hole would be. On the other hand, you have another scale, which is a curvature scale. That's how much mass divided by the cube of the characteristic length that this object has. And again, you could have a black hole of kind of uh, mass, uh, solar mass uh, uh, size sits here. So that would be the upper corner. But on the other hand, if you now think of a supermassive black hole, now while the, you're still staying at this corner, you calm down because now the curvature is lower and lower. In fact, there are supermassive black holes where the curvature they produce is weaker than the one that the curvature we feel here on Earth. So general activity has actually been tested in a whole bunch of regimes down here. So some by pulsar timing arrays. Uh, so we just look at pulsars. We do very uh, exquisite measurements of their orbital behavior around another object. And then there are very tiny general relativistic effects that describe deviations from Newtonian theory. And uh, those deviations have been measured. And the uh, result has been in excellent agreement with general activity. But that's in an object that, even though the individual objects, which are neutron stars, which are kind of the next best thing uh, next to a, a black hole, they are moving very slowly. So the kind of potentials of the binary that they, they uh, probe is on the weak side. Um, then there are kind of light bendings, better and better light bending measurements. But it would be ideal to go here because of not only the ability to test the largest gravitational potential, but also to, the, to test the largest curvature. And if you think, as you know, that general activity is not the ultimate theory of gravity, that something else should replace it, at some point we should begin to see deviations from general activity. And one argument is that those deviations will probably be governed by curvature uh, strengths. So the higher the curvatures we can, we can probe, the better. So we, you haven't seen black holes yet, but let me just tell you kind of in one slide, kind of the ultimate knowledge you're going to have of black holes once you, once you go through the uh, lectures that David will give you, is that if you assume that the system is stationary, so there's no time dependence on, on, on your space time, you're in a vacuum uh, scenario that has a strong curvature, uh, then black holes, the solutions of black holes can be found. They describe this region of space time where nothing can escape um, from it. And they're described by essentially just two parameters, the mass and angular momentum, because at least in, in, in the universe, we believe that black holes are essentially neutral of charge. If you think that a black hole could be charged, then there would be a third parameter, which is a charge. But by and large, it only depends on the mass Angular, and angular momentum and probably charge. So it doesn't matter how you form them. You can collapse whatever you want. You can make it at the collision of, a, of, a, of, of, say, our sun into a radius that is much smaller than one kilometer. 
uh, or you can just make it out of a whole bunch of, I don't know, uh, uh, buildings or kind of lawyers, politicians, very compressed. You could form also black holes out of that. And at the end of the day, we don't know from classical measurements what made it, where it was kind of matter or annoying politicians. Uh, both, at the end of the day, will just only know about the mass and the spin of the black hole. Because of this black hole, it's just a one-way membrane uh, at the horizon, which in a non-spinning black hole is given in size by twice its mass. But if it's spinning, it's half of it. It's M. If it's spinning, it's maximum uh, rotation. And there is a maximum rotation that you can have, uh, unless you have a singularity. Um, there is one interesting thing that generatively has is that there is this innermost radius. There is a radius below which you can never have a stable circular orbit. That in itself is very important because Newtonian theory doesn't have this. In Newtonian theory, you can have arbitrarily, given a central object, arbitrarily close orbits that are stable uh, from that orbit or uh, from that uh, central object. But in general activity, there is some radius below which no stable circular orbit exists. And the, colli the collision of this object with the central object is unavoidable. You can also do very simple, uh, a very simple calculation, and this is kind of a celebrated result by Hawking, that the maximum energy you can extract from a black hole is 29% of its mass. So that's a whopping number. If you can remember what nuclear physics efficiencies are, these are all order of 0.1%. So somehow it tells you that if you can tap this gravitational energy trapped in a black hole, you can get a lot of energy from the effective mass that the black hole has. And the other thing we know, if you take these black holes and you perturb them, by and large, for massless perturbations, you can prove that all modes are stable. So you kick a black hole, the black hole will wobble, and then wants to kind of go down to a quiescent solution that is described again by one of these uh, members of this family. So if, you, if that slide, if you use that slide and you go into the astrophysics world, that's all you need. That's all you need to try and explain, at least come up with building blocks, some of the most energetic events in our universe. So this is an example of a tiny uh, region there, but in reality it's a quasar. So, th so there's a galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole sitting in the, in the, at the origin. We don't even see the scale of the galaxy. There are jets coming out of it, which are in extent extremely long. So something, somehow, it, at the center of this galaxy, is channeling a lot, of, a lot of energy and collimating in a particular way that uh, creates these jets. Uh, and this is an early rendition of what could be going on in there, but also could be something else, could be a black hole interacting with some accretion disk and creating something that we know as gamma ray bursts. This is the most energetic thing we have detected in the universe in elect the electromagnetic band. When one of these things goes on, uh, the whole rest of the uh, uh, energy combined uh, emitting electromagnetic waves is, uh, is uh, significantly less luminous. So this is just a ridiculous amount of energy in a short amount of time. And for the longest time, the origin of a subfamily of this gamma ray burst was uh, a mystery. Um, and it was partially resolved. And we think it's going to be eventually fully resolved by detections of gravity, uh, further detection of gravitational waves. So this is on the context of uh, astrophysics. So you can build a lot with very simple ingredients on, on the GR side. And we also know that black holes have been kind of very, um, uh, very important ingredients in studies in, in holography, trying to kind of uh, obtain information of how some CFTs behave by actually going through ADS and study black holes in anti -deciter. So black holes are nowadays kind of one of the fundamental tools of doing uh, physics in many uh, different uh, topics. And so you'll encounter them one way or another. So before uh, we go into some kind of details of uh, the detections and how we get there, let's just kind of do some numerology. So if we try to understand, we, tr we estimate how much energy is coming out of the sun, it's of the order of 10 to the 33 ergs per second. And we understand that this comes from fusion mainly from going from hydrogen into helium. A supernova is about 9, 10 orders of magnitude higher than that. 
And that is the combination of both fusion, but also the collapse of the object, which is releasing quite a bit of binding energy. Now a GRB, a gamma ray burst, this thing that I mentioned before, come in two flavors, one the long and the shorts. Uh, so the longs are, are understood to uh, be produced by supernova, and the shorts are these things that uh, was uh, not so clear uh, until last year, and uh, both observations and theoretical models are pointing very strongly to the fact that these are collision of neutron stars or black hole and neutron stars. But they released 10 to the 49 to the 10 to the 51 ergs, so we went again 10 orders of the magnitude uh, or thereabouts up. And you could argue or you could uh, do a very simple exercise and think just from purely classical arguments, what could we think would be the uppermost luminosity of a system? And you can just use dimension and arguments and realize that if you do this combination, the speed of light to the fifth power divided by g, that has, has a uh, units of energy per second, and it's equal to 10 to the 59th ergs per second. So somehow there is the ability, there is the feeling that maybe there is some system that could fill the gap from here all the way to these levels. And perhaps black holes are precisely the, the, the place to go look for it. So I think you heard from David a little bit about gravitational waves. So if you go to Einstein's equations, the left-hand side of Einstein's equations tell you something about the curvature, curvature tensor, so you measure how curved your space-time is. And the right-hand side has the source that produces that curvature, or some of the portion of the source that produces that curvature. So this is your stress and your tensor of your, say, your matter source. But far out, what you find out is that you can, if you take, choose your coordinates the right way and your variables the right way, you can write the equations as some wave op operator acting on perturbations of uh, flat space-time. So when we are here on Earth, what we measure to leading order is that the metric, the distance, distances are measured as uh, we live in a flat space-time with every now and then some very tiny correction. And these corrections are tied to a source by this equation. And the size of the correction is related to the second or the acceleration of a quadrupole. So given an object that changes its quadrupole in time, it produces this wave that propagates away from the source at the speed of light. But its strain is governed by kind of this combination. So it has the acceleration of the quadrupole multiplied by an extremely tiny number. This is why these uh, um, kind of uh, perturbations that we feel are extremely small and why it took 100 years from theory to experiment to get to the regime where you can actually hope to measure those extremely tiny numbers. So if you're going to try uh, and convince the government to pay for one of these experiments, you first have to kind of make a physics case that will say this is very a uh, strong argument to put money here as opposed to elsewhere. So the kind of, kind of wish list that was presented to the National Science Foundation and the uh, analogs in Europe to try and, and ask for funding for this is, well, we want to test where general relativity stays consistent in regimes where kind of the potentials are of order one, the velocities are of, uh, are of order the speed of light, et cetera, because there we might find that general relativity actually begins to fail and hopefully the data will guide us into what should replace it. We also want to know the population and existence of, say, for instance, black holes. Why? It's because, well, first, black hole evidence was mounting from the point of view of electromagnetic observations through these gamma ray bursts, quasars, etc. But we haven't had, or we hadn't had, a definite uh, uh, telltale sign that they were there. In particular, black holes, if we have a, a population through the universe, especially in the early universe, could make up a little bit, or all of it, uh, of dark matter. Of course, by now we think we wouldn't be able to make up all of it. But just knowing what at least partial part of the composition of dark matter is, this amount of energy of the universe, which is much, much higher than the uh, baryon uh, uh, energy of matter in baryon that we can see, is fundamental. And also the population of neutron stars uh, and the location uh, where they are, their angular rotation rates or whatever. So in general, understanding the population of these systems is another very important topic. 
We also know that neutron stars exist. These are things that we have seen. Uh, we have seen them for a long time. We know they, are, they make pulsars, etc. But we also can estimate what is the density that these uh, objects have in matter. And their densities are way, way above that we can access in uh, laboratories, even in very high energy experiments. So it is one way to look at matter in a regime that is completely inaccessible on Earth, uh, labor or Earth experiments. So that's another one. And ultimately, we would like to combine observations in the electromagnetic side and particles with gravitational waves to try and understand the most of our universe. And of course, the most exciting thing is the things that we cannot write because we don't know are surprises. And surprises usually uh, point to new physics, and uh, that's the most exciting thing. Of course, you also need to make a more credible case, not just a wish list. And we know of the Hulsar, the Hulse-Taylor Pulsar, uh, who actually got the Nobel Prize by measuring very, very minute deviations in the orbit of a binary pulsar through the emission of gravitational waves. And this is kind of a plot that is amazing. The error bars are included in the plot, and the solid line is a prediction from general activity. So this is not directly measuring the gravitational waves, but you're measuring the impact of the energy that is being lost from the system through gravitational waves, which make the orbit tighten. And because of that, the period uh, is, is shorter. And once you actually measure that period versus kind of a long time span, you can confront the expectation of general activity with uh, the, uh, the actual observations, and the agreement is amazing. You can put things in perspective and say, well, what is the strength of this perturbation, this strain, as it's called, of a system that is kind of has mass m, has a separ typical separation r, whatever that is, as observed when the perturbation t uh, get it to an observer that is at distance little r. So the strain is essentially a combination of the potential at the source times the potential at the location of the observer. And if you put these numbers together for, say, an a system like this one that has two neutron stars at some given separation, you obtain a number that's 10 to the minus 21. So you have to resolve relative separation, relative changes in distance of order 10 to the minus 21 to try and detect the gravitational waves that this system, or a system like this, is producing. So for that, uh, and this I think you've seen, you go through the theory, you understand that the theory uh, tells us the gravitational waves have two polarizations, the one that is called, the two polarizations across the plus and cross, one kind of deforms an, uh, a circle into an ellipse, and it continuously oscillates, and the other one is 45 degrees rotated by that. Understanding this tells you that the ideal configuration to try and measure that is something that has kind of this L-shaped structure, because if a gravitational wave is kind of coming this way, it will maximize the relative difference between this mirror position with respect to the center and that one. So because this one will get, say, elongated. This one will be brought closer to the central station, and this will continue. And by doing very careful measurements, you can actually try and detect uh, that minute uh, scaling. Of course, we're talking about relative differences, so the ideal scenario is to make this baseline as long as possible, and this is how LIGO uh, has been contract constructed, and, and Virgo, that has baselines of order three and four kilometers. You also need to fight with this, the noise, because this detector is sitting on Earth. There's a lot of variations. We know that when an earthquake happens, uh, distances, unfortunately, do change, and the distances between these mirrors will actually be uh, affected. And so you need to be able to uh, uh, ensure that no other effect could have affected this relative distance of mirrors. And not only that, you're pushing on the limits, because remember, we're trying to keep the numbers of the error 10 to the minus 21 at least, but you actually want to go a lot deeper than that. And so you actually fight with lots of things. On the high frequency regime, uh, you fight with the quantum shot noise. You have a laser that is high power, it's just hitting on this mirror, and it's beginning to make it uh, fluctuate. Those fluctuations also impact on the faces of the laser, which then tells you the, uh, the, the distance between kind of the mirror and the central station has changed. So you actually have to fi fight with this. In turn, 
you can actually use this as a feature, and there are people actively trying to work with LIGO experiment, LIGO type experiments to do some quantum, very interesting quantum measurement. On the left side, we have the fact that the Earth is typically shaking at uh, some given uh, very minute scales, but at those frequencies are affecting uh, the, the low frequency side. And this frequency from here to there is interesting because well, you went to politicians and you asked them for money and you told them there should be a, a possible detection of this. And so you have to argue there were real sources out there you can go for. And so this frequency window is thought as ideal for the kind of sources we understood, uh, at least to some degree, were producing gravitational waves, which were binary neutral stars. This Hall Taylor pulsar of which we measure indirectly the uh, emission of gravitational waves, set a scale of frequency. So if you actually have a detector that kind of targets the 10 hertz to a kilohertz, the range of masses that you're targeting for a binary system is between a solar mass and 100 solar masses. The higher the mass, the lower the signal will be peaking, and the lower it's to the right. So here, you're targeting lower mass black holes, here you're targeting higher mass uh, or well, black holes or compact objects. But that's not the only one. So on the, gravity, on the uh, Earth uh, base detectors, there are two in the US, Hanford and Livingstone. There is a third in Germany. It's called the Geo, Geo 600. This uh, is a, it's small, too small for actually uh, use for trying to uh, detect gravitational waves. But because it's, uh, it's kind of a better playground, many of the technologies are tested first here, and they're incorporated in the other detector. There's an Italian-French detector called Virgo outside Pisa. This is three kilometers. These are four kilometers. There is a third detector, which is a kind of the clone of these ones here that is going to be built eventually in India. There are lots of interesting stories of why things are delayed there. Uh, and there is a NAR one in Kagura in the Kamioka mine in Japan. Uh, that's also three kilometers. And this whole thing gives you a network of detectors. And the network, the network of detectors is, is very important because each individual detector can detect a gravitational wave, but you need at least three to know where it's coming from. If you don't know what, if you don't have three, the best you can see is say it's a gravitational wave has come from a circle in the sky, and that's not great for doing astrophysics. Of course, there is more than that. One is to uh, then go to space. There is this. Uh, thing that was a concept for many years, but now it has a launching date of 2034. It's called LISA. Uh, these are lasers. Uh, the, the, I, the principle is similar to that of LIGO, but because you're targeting much higher masses, the frequencies are much lower, which then means the wavelengths that you have to accommodate here would be much longer, and the distance between these uh, stations is of order million kilometers, as opposed to uh, just three or four. And also, you can use pulsars, because we have been seeing pulsars for such a long time. We know the time of arrival exquisitely well. And if at some point the time of arrival gets to lag or uh, advance, then you could speculate that a gravitational wave just went through and make the distance between this Earth and this pulsar, let's say, longer for a while and then shorter. So this is what this experiment is aiming for. Uh, so altogether, this is like thinking electromagnetically and going from, I don't know, the microwaves uh, or uh, all the way to gamma rays, the same thing is here, except that now we're talking about different sources. So ground-based interferometers sit at about uh, between one to a kilohertz. The LISA sits down here from 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus three. PTA sits even lower at 10 to the minus nine hertz. And eventually, if we have a way to detect primordial gravitational waves, that would be done through the impact on perhaps the CMB. So how do we go about detecting? Because one thing is to have a very sensitive detector, but we can act, when we can actually go and see uh, the detector itself, it's producing a lot of noise. Typically, a signal will be buried in the noise, and you need to train the detector on your analysis to pick the signals up. And this is similar to the experience you all have had when you enter a room that everyone is talking, you cannot distinguish what uh, anyone is saying, but if someone says your name, uh, you pick it up. So your brain has been trained to pick some particular uh, combinations uh, 
for whatever reason, maybe that's subsistence, uh, but the same thing we need to train the experiments. So you need theory to tell you what particular temp, uh, waveforms you should look for, and then you do a particular convolution of the signal from the detector that is continuously producing uh, um, uh, whatever signals, which may have a true gravitational wave signal or just be pure noise, and then that this convolution filters the signal out. One thing that, in general, you cannot do uh, with gravitational waves that you could do with pretty much any other experiment is turn the, the sources off. Gravitational waves have this particularly useful and at the same time annoying feature that travel through the universe and scatter. So at the moment, if you look up, we don't see the sky because our, the ceiling is just scattering all the photons away from, from the sky. But if a gravitational wave goes through, it goes through just uh, as if nothing were there. So at the LHC, if you're trying to gauge the error level, the systematics of your experiment, you can turn the source, you know nothing is coming in, and you can just understand what the basic noise level is. We cannot do with that with the universe. We cannot ask the universe, oh, shut up. We don't want any gravitational waves for a while because we don't need to understand our noise sources. So this is also one of the reasons why we have more than one detector. Because if you might have something that looks like a signal in one, but not in the R one, and you do the due diligence analysis, then you will be able to tell what is fake and what may be real. And so the work of many theories has been to, in the theories and the sources we know of, predict what the gravitational wave characteristics would be to use here. If, on the other hand, we don't know what the true signal is, for instance, because we're looking or to the possibility that it might be surprises, something that we haven't thought of because there might be other objects out there, or a theory we don't have control of because we don't know of it yet. Um, then you look of, for excess power in some way. So there is a many, many efforts within the LIGO-Virgo scientific, LIGO scientific collaboration that look for what they call unmodeled signals, things that we don't know, things that go bump in the night, but we have never heard before. So, I'll just show you a couple things here. Um, so, in but in the tr in trying to obtain these gravitational wave uh, models that then can be used by the detector, the, the detector detection enterprise itself, the data analyst. Um, the reason we want to do that is many folds. One is if you know what to expect, you can do a better job at digging the signal out. Therefore, you can see much further. You don't pay a, a, a noise price. But more importantly, at the end of the day, once you have detected, you can go back to your model and ask what are the physical characteristics of the system that produce a gravitational wave. And that's when you begin to do astrophysics. You can ask what are the masses, what are the spins, uh, how rapid these objects collided, where they are, etc. That is all enhanced and actually, in many cases, uh, made possible only through the knowledge of uh, the details of the gravitational wave. Now, if you think you have two objects in a binary, you can ask the following question. How long will it take for these objects to come together through gravitational waves? As uh, you'll see more, and I, I briefly mentioned, gravitational waves are taking energy from the system. They are taking angular momentum from the system. When that happens, the orbit shrinks, just as we saw uh, in the binary pulsar uh, that gave Hulse and Taylor a Nobel Prize. But if you ask, how long will it take, given some separation? You'll quickly find out that there is a minimum separation below which they can measure within a Hubble time through the emission of gravitational waves. If they are formed further out, something has to, brought, has to, has to bring these objects together uh, because otherwise they wouldn't merge. So there are other interactions with our system, like dynamical friction uh, and by interaction with other objects that if these objects are formed sufficiently far, they need to be brought together through other means before they can merge, which is an important. If you see things merging and you can detect the time scale, then you can in indirectly say that there has to be other uh, elements uh, that brought these objects close enough. And depending, once you know where they are, you can actually begin to do that kind of astrophysics. That's not something I do, but that's very interesting as well. Once they get close enough where radiation reaction really drives the system, then it's gravitational waves taking angular momentum from the system and the energy that brings them together. And you can understand the system uh, through something that's called a post-Newtonian expansion, where you write the equations of motion 
a la Newtonian theory, but it would hold a whole bunch of corrections that come from general relativity. And these are well understood, and we can understand how some, uh, how different effects come into play. <laughs> One that is very interesting is when you actually could tell apart a black hole and a neutron star, or two different neutron stars. Remember, one thing we wanted to do is to tell what is the equation of state? How is matter behaving at this very high energy, at these very high densities? Well, it turns out that when coming, they're orbiting about each other. The internal effects the, that will tell you something about the equation of state show up way, way down in an expansion in, say, V over C or M over R. So it comes out at M over R to the 10 power. This is a tiny, tiny number. So not only are we looking for a tiny signal, but on that tiny signal, there is a much tinier modulation that tells us about what the, effect, what the internal structure of this object is. So a black hole has a zero here. A neutron star has this thing here. And we're trying to go after this thing to tell say, a neutron star from a black hole, or what particularly the radius of a neutron star might be. Um, what does spin orbit refer to? Yeah, so this is, so suppose now you have two objects that are going around each other. That's fine. But now give one a spin. So there is a torque, an effective torque that could take place between the spin of the object and the orbital angular momentum. Uh, uh, and then there are spin-spin interactions, which is the spin, this spin, torquing this R1 and vice versa. And these, again, are tiny effects that all have to be taken into account because, in particular, that's what you want to extract. You want to extract the spin of the object. You want to extract um, the tides. You want to find out what the typical size of the object is. And all this is part of the astrophysics we want to do. However, this kind of perturbation on M over R it's only valid as long as this m over r, or this v over c, are not too crazily high. So if this v over c is below 0.1, then, or 0.01, then you can see that further and further down are smaller and smaller effects. But if this thing gets to be order, order 1, then we're in trouble. This perturbation doesn't work anymore. And this is where you need uh, numerical simulations, because Einstein equations, which can be written in a very simple form, so if you we we'll write, write like this again. And let's say we're even thinking, we're talking about black holes. So this is, this is not there because it's a vacuum solution. Zero, this looks awfully simple. But in reality, it's a pain in the neck how complicated this equation, this resulting equation is. And you actually have to go rely on simulations to tell you how things are behaving. And I always like to quote this. Uh, this thing that Stanislaw Ulam said. So often in general activity, we talk about black holes, we talk about particular solutions, but usually these are the black holes. The solutions we know are extremely special in the number of assumptions we brought in to be able to solve this freaking equation. And in case we know some dynamics in pencil and paper, it's through perturbations, we're only probing the linear behavior of some particular solutions. So in reality, we have been looking at the elephant. Everything else we have no clue about, or very little clue. Um, so once you buy the bullet, you put things in a computer, you can do this kind of, this is the movie you've seen many times entering the, the building. This is the collision of two black holes and how as they're getting closer and closer, waves are being produced, the waves propagate out. The rate at which these objects are getting closer it gets faster and faster. Eventually, they merge, and the, the black hole, the, the final object, is a black hole, and it goes quiescent very quickly. And after the merger takes place, you can use perturbations again to gain some knowledge. So waveform looks more or less like this. If I zoom in in the merger itself, it's also very simple, but the amplitude is much higher, and you can estimate how much energy the system produced or was able to radiate, and it's ordered of between three and twelve percent of the total mass of the system. Sorry, how can we estimate the energy radius in gravitational waves? Say again, say again. How can we estimate the energy radius in gravitational waves? Great. So first, you have to buy the bullet and do the, one of these simulations. Once you do that, and this is the, always I drive this to my students. I, tame, I do a lot of computation. But computation should serve a final purpose, which is gain insight. And the ultimate fate of a numerical code is one you have to throw it away at the end of the day because you learn enough that you don't need to use it anymore. And so first you get this. You understand 
So initially, it was thought, and some people would give you some interesting slides, that the merger uh, could be a, a very complicated. Because here, you're perturbing a black hole with another black hole. So you're perturbing with some object with an ordered one. So it could have been all sort of crazy thing. I mean, uh, uh, whatever dragons could have come up flying here, and it would have been fine in principle, which we didn't have anything, uh, any particular knowledge. Once you know it's sufficiently smooth, it's telling you, well, maybe this previous understanding of GR plus small as in black hole, or this single black hole plus small perturbations, or Newtonian, maybe I can push my lack and push it further uh, into that. And then what you find out is that what really happens is you have taken these objects from a very far distance into a very close distance, and at that close distance, a single black hole form, a common horizon forms. What you release is the binding energy of the system from what it worked here to when it was at some given radius. And that radius you can now estimate and give some reasonable arguments that is the innermost circular circular orbit, ob this inner, innermost circular orbit radius of the object you're about to form. And if you build up, then there is a very simple uh, kind of sort of phenomenological, sort of analytical model you can do to actually estimate this, and you get this amount of energy very, uh, very accurate to within 1% of this answer, you're, uh, you're getting a very good, uh, a good detail. Uh, so that's to give you the broad details of the merger. But unfortunately, the actual details of the gravitational waves are still in crucial to give it to data analysis. So that was it. So I'll, I'll go quickly through some, some examples. That was for two black holes. So two black holes are the most boring thing you can imagine because that's all, that's all they give you. They give you gravitational waves and that's all. If you change one of the black holes by interstar at least, things get more interesting. Because now this black hole can do several things. First, of course, the merger will produce something. And what it produces will depend on the size, the relative size of the neutral star with respect to the black hole. If the black hole is huge, then the interstellar gets swallowed whole by the black hole, and then you don't get to see anything. If the black hole is sufficiently small, then what could happen is the neutral will get closer and closer, and at some point, it will get disrupted. It will just get shared apart by the black hole. That was the first case where the neutral gets swallowed in. But let's imagine this is the innermost stable circular orbit. Past here, this is when the star falls in. But there is this thing called the Roche lobe, uh, or the tidal radius, uh, above, uh, below which this star gets shredded apart. If you shred it apart, then you form an object that is a black hole with an accretion disk around. Now, this can shine, and can shine extremely brightly. And in particular, if you actually put the numbers, it can really release this 10 to the 51 ergs. And so maybe it's a putative uh, engine of this gamma ray burst. If you have two neutral stars, things can also be very interesting. You can merge, and these two neutral stars can merge and form a third neutron star, and has very rich uh, uh, phenomenology associated to it, not only generates gravitational waves, but also very strong electromagnetic waves. Both systems could just release a ton of material out there, and that will have its impact. Uh, the merger can also give rise to a black hole at the center with an accretion disk, and all these it's potential sources of gravitational waves, well, so definitely sources of gravitational waves, but potential sources of this gamma ray burst. Um, so let me not just go there. So this is an example of the first detection. Let me see if you can see, hear that? No, you cannot hear that. Can you hear that? No. So this was what LIGO and, and Livingston saw. Um, this was a very lucky event. It happened to be so close, relatively speaking, it was still at 1.2 billion light years away. The masses of the objects were so high that the signal was so strong that that's what you saw in the detector. You didn't need any guidance whatsoever of theory. This freaking thing just moved in front of people's eyes. The first reaction of the people were there was, this is, this is an injection. LIGO, to test the technology, has the ability to put either in hardware by shaking, by literally shaking the mirrors with servos, or in the software, just feeding a gravitational wave, this is what they saw. And they said, okay, this is ridiculous because it's so strong that someone just puts too strong a source. This, we don't expect this. Um, once they said, oh, crap, no, no one injected anything because in reality, this took place three days before the detector 
was actually in real to start operation. So the ability to, to inject has been taken away. So then the second thought was someone hacked in our servers, servers and feed that thing in there. So it took them a long time to make sure to com really convince themselves that this was re real. Especially the thing that was fishy is that this thing, once you analyze the frequencies involved in here, the amplitude, it tells you that these were two 30 solar mass black holes. 30 solar mass black holes were things that astrophysicists work in population models that kind of try to predict what, how many of these black holes and what the characteristics are, were never in their kind of favorite set of sources. They never were very, were very much willing to go forward and said, oh, we really expect black holes of masses above, 30, oh, above 20 or so. So this was the first surprise. So arguably, the very first detection gave black holes where we weren't expecting it, or where we were strongly expecting it. Um, and, the, well, and there are a few other things that I'll, I'll tell you in a sec. Typically, then this is an example of a second detection. Um, and then there are six, six in total. And actually, official, there are six in total. There may be more. Um, and then LIGO is going to turn on again in February, and many more will come. But this is what you more generically expect. This is the second signal where underline has been kind of the, the true signal has been highlighted with uh, this solid line. So the R1 is a noise. You see a whole bunch of crap, and hidden in it, you do you, is a waveform. And by doing this cross correlation, you actually can accumulate signal to noise. And if you accumulate enough, then you call this a real signal. And this is what these plots are showing. And this is SNR. So typically, if you're doing this analysis, you get numbers of order two, 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 two. All of a sudden, you got something of order 10. Then you flag that as a real signal. And then you begin the work of cross correlation between uh, all the different experiments, making sure that uh, no, no glitches took place, et cetera. So in a single slide, and I think this is the last time anyone can put in a slide all the signals that LIO has produced, because next year, it will be about one every other week. So the number of, or, or maybe once a month, the number of uh, signals will very quickly add up. So this is a list. And just to point a few things, this is how far they've been. So so far, so far from four, 400 megaparsecs to 1,000 megaparsecs. Uh, the masses ranging from 30s to 12 and 7. Uh, some very weird kind of uh, results on on what the possible angular momentum of the final black hole is, it turns out that the one, like, one thing that LIO can do is to estimate the projection of the individual spins along the orbital angular momentum. And this is this thing called chi effective. And it's extremely strange that that projection, so you add this one to that one projected along the orbital angular momentum, and you added them up. It's very strange that they are all essentially consistent with zero. That's extremely weird. That would be saying that this nature somehow is producing black holes with zero spin. Why would it do that? We don't believe that's true. Somehow, nature wants to make them such that the, if they have spin, the spin is more or less on the orbital plane as opposed to having a non trivial, a really non trivial contribution along the orbital, uh, orbital angular momentum. That would be very strange. Or maybe there is an interaction with something else that depletes the angular momentum of the individual black holes prior to them coming together. That would be very strange, but extremely exciting. And there are people in the building, Mina Arbanitaki, has been proposing that maybe one model for dark matter, this action model, can actually do that. Um, so they're very interesting things. So, so far, six is not large enough a sample to say we are in a real problem or very interesting opportunity. But very soon, this will turn into an oddity, into, wow. Something very deep is going on. I usually use the word holy crap, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> so this is, if you actually put everything together, the other weird thing is that if you see what is it that LIO has told us, so LIO has encountered these kind of black holes, where, which are all relatively massive compared to the one that has been estimated by electromagnetic observations. So, so far, they seem to be a binary population, but we have to be very careful that LIGO sees more black holes that are but they are heavy than those that are lighter. Black holes that are heavier emit a stronger gravitational wave, so we can see them further. The further we see them, the volume goes like the cube of the distance. So a system that has 
my total mass two versus the total mass four, I see the a volume of four, eight times the volume of four than the one I see of two. So this is why preferential LIGO has been seen the massive black holes. We'll see what happens in the next observation run um, of where it begins to find uh, things down here. So let me just give you some, so this is, let me just show you a movie. This is a movie of two neutral stars coming together. The important thing I want to point out is this, the merger takes place, you form this blob, but then you begin to throw matter outside. So one thing that people have been speculating for a while is that this matter is now very neutral rich. Very neutral rich matter being thrown out out there, then it begins to do whatever it wants to do. In particular, there is nuclear processes called nuclear, uh, neutron capture that can begin to aggregate, essentially starting from a neutron and produce heavier and heavier elements. The, the more neutron rich the material you throw out, the, and the higher, uh, the, the, well, and the speed, the, depending on the speed you send it and, and how much, you can begin to populate the heavier side of the atomic, uh, uh, of the, the table of elements. And so for the longest time, the origin of elements like the lanthanides, very, very high uh, atomic number, has been a question mark. The prevalent uh, hypothesis has been that, that this was produced by supernovas. But surely, but slowly, the, the case has been made against that, just because supernovas are too, happen too often, and if they were to happen in the, in the rate that we do, and if they were to be the sites of these heavy elements, we should have many more, the abundance of those elements should be much higher than this measure. So there has to be some other site where this happens, and the next best candidate was the collision of two neutral stars, or maybe a black hole and a neutral star. So you go through well, all these, you, you can, this is an, from that simulation you can estimate the amount of ejecta you have and how neutron rich it is. And then, um, you actually get lucky. And so this is what happened last year. So LIO was happily taking data, and then all of a sudden, that's a gravitational wave. That's a, fer that's a gamma ray burst in Fermi. So this was kind of, um, it's the most touching moment I have had in my life. I mean, how in the world? This is for something that if you ask when LIO was designed, what would be the ideal scenario? I would have written something like this. And then I would have said, there's no way this is gonna happen uh, in, in many, many years. And it happened kind of right when many things just line up. It's the first signal of a binary neutral star. And this freaking thing happened to be just around the corner. It's so close, it's just 40 megaparsecs away. And not only the signal in gravitational waves is so strong, but, uh, that's not, a, that's not particularly exciting because we could have seen it even further out, but because it's so strong and because Fermi was on and saw it, then everyone turned everything to the sky to try to see this event. So within no time, 30% of all astronomers, of all facilities out there were pointing to that little corner in the universe. This little corner was allowed to be established by two things. So Virgo, the Italian detector had been down. It only joined very late last year, and it joined kind of two weeks before this event. It also got even more lucky because a week before this event, there was another binary black hole. Now, you, the fact that you could see binary black holes in, in LIO was very firmly established by that, by that. Having seen it also in Virgo, now established that Virgo is working well, that Virgo sees it also tells you that, okay, everything is working well in, in Virgo. And then you see this. Virgo did not see this, this event. Why did it not see it? Because as you said, as we said, you need three uh, detectors at least to triangulate to see in the sky. But they are dark patches. So even a non-detection tells you if Virgo doesn't see it, it has to be in, in the direction of a dark patch. Fermi is not great at localizing, but many other cameras turn on at the right time, and they were able to quickly pinpoint where it was because also this thing was too close. 40 megaparsecs is so close, there aren't that many galaxies that you, could, that you could go hunting. So you have a few. So they went from 100 possible sources, uh, location in the skies, to just one in no time. 
And then everything got pointed in that direction. And so this is a movie that illustrates how facilities on Earth got to see this event. And so some are optical uh, telescopes, so you only can see when it's dark. Some are radio, so like ASCAP, so they can see both uh, night and, and day. And so all these facilities were taking measurements of this thing ev at every single time. This was September last year. To this day, your detectors are seeing the aftermath of this event. So something terribly violent happened. Uh, and I'll tell you what, it, what we think it was. In particular, this is the emission in between the infrared and the ultraviolet that was detected versus time. And the characteristics of this tell you that the ejecta, the amount of material that was thrown out of the system is consistent with that of a binary interest star. It's consistent with binary interest stars with equation state within a subset of possible equation states because, as I said, we don't know what the equation state of this binary star is. So just by seeing this in combination with everything else, kind of shrunk the realm of possibilities of what a neutron star could be made of. And the characteristics of this also tell us that the lanthanides were produced. Not only that, you could also predict of these heavy elements how much of them were produced. And so one particularly cute number to quote is the amount of ejector produced, and among many things, gold. How much gold? About two to three times the amount of mass on Earth. So just a single event did a heck of a lot of things. And I'm just going to show you uh, uh, just some very um, uh, a few represented examples. The mass is of in between, say, 1.5, both of them. The radiant energy, these are objects that are much fast, fatter. Their radius is much larger. The collision is violent, but not as violent as black holes. So the radiant energy is about one quarter of solar mass. It's still very high. Distance 40 megaparsecs, as I said, no one would have put more than a cent betting that we would see something this close. From gravitational waves alone, we saw no modulation whatsoever in that gravitational wave that I show you. Remember these tiny, these modulations were sitting way down on the V over C? Because they were not seen, you can now just bound, put an upper bound of how tidally deformable this star was, was and particularly how big the radius was. So you know that the equation say cannot be within a particular corner. It doesn't matter what this terminology is. But it's beginning to say that, OK, equation states are such that the radius is more likely to be around 13, 14 kilometers, and completely saying it's unlikely that it's between 15 and 16 kilometers. Because there was copious electromagnetic counterparts, uh, you, uh, you could tell that at least one of them was an interstellar. star. Now, because you have both electromagnetic and gravitational wave signals, you can actually do things like try to measure the, dis the, the, the difference between the propagation speed of light versus the propagation speed of gravitational waves. And now you can put a bound. This is the first time ever this bound has been put. You can also test, <clears throat> in general relativity, electromagnetism is coupled, is coupled minimally to the metrics. So you can actually test that idea. And again, you can put, again, the ver for the first time, a bound that was not uh, allowed before. Another thing that was done with the very first detection of gravitational waves from binary black hole is estimate the mass of a graviton. And the mass of a graviton was given with just one detection, a bound that was four orders of magnitude better than the best uh, bound of the photon. So we've been seeing photons all the time from the caveman. And I don't know if the caveman was doing measurements, but we have been doing measurements of the possible mass of the photon for a long time. And it took one measure of gravitational waves to put a bound that is four orders of magnitude better. Um, and then there is a whole bunch of other things that I, I won't go into, but if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to uh, go after. So what we think it was, was a collision of two neutron stars. Then the merger took place. A huge uh, amount of matter gets thrown out. But also a black hole form at the jet gets produced. The jet was seen, that was the ping that Fermi saw. And so now at least we know at least some class of gamma ray bursts seem to be, well, are directly connected to the collision of two, these two objects. Um, neutron stars can be measured all around. These two are sitting somewhere here. We still don't know because of the characteristics of the system and also the deficiencies of the experiment itself. 
whether the final object uh, we didn't see direct gravitational waves that will confirm that this object was a black hole. We seem to things are consistent with it being uh, forming a black hole afterwards, but that's not known. And there is a lot of interesting questions that one can go after. But still, there is a lot of puzzles. The equation of state has not been fully finalized. We know that some has been discovered, but there are some others. The final state, as I said, is still an interesting question. We have yet to see a black hole in the star uh, uh, system. Um, we want to do much better in the testing of general relativity, and these are things that are just beginning to take place. So let me just conclude here. So gravitational wave astronomy is definitely on. It got started in 2015, and it's just going to ramp up. Um, I joke that this was, in our generation, the most important detect, and actually half joke, because I am serious in saying this, this is the most important physical thing, physics thing, physical result that has happened in our generation. And uh, this field will just keep exploding. It took from the very first conception of the first kind of interferometer uh, detector about four decades to get to this point. But it's important to think what else can gravitational waves do? Gravitational waves have been essentially uh, a field that was populated by people from general activity and people from astrophysics. But there are all sort of other questions I'm going to go after. There's cosmology, there's particle physics, there's all, all sort of other things. So people are coming here. And so, Regardless of what you think you should do in the future, and you should follow your heart, just keep an eye on what's going on here, because there might be a way to connect it. And future detectors will reach to redshift of 20. So we've only been seeing the local neighborhood of, of, our, of our planet, um, relatively speaking. But the next generation detector will have, kind of, not only will they reach far, but this, the signal to noise ratios will be ridiculous. It will be three, four or so magnitude higher than the ones we have now. And so the sky is the limit as far as what uh, one could end up doing with gravitational waves. I'll stop here. I need to run to another meeting. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you may have, but it will have to be some quick now, and then you can always meet me, uh, find me in 328. Thank you. All right, so I hope that everybody now shares the excitement about gravitational waves. And, and you know, the really, really the fact that it took 100 years after they were predicted. It's, it's like amazing, right? So, so with this, if, if you compare the Higgs, right? It was predicted, let's say, 50 years ago and finally measured. It's a baby problem, right? It don't know it uh, took 50 years. But this one, like from the prediction, the actual measurement is 100 years. And so that tells you, you know, how difficult it is and how big the prediction actually was. All right, so last time I told you a very interesting fact is that if you do the multipole expansion, expansion of your fields for an isolated system, of course, the leading order is the monopole, uh, and then you have the dipole, and then you have the quadrupole, and so on. So now, not all, all of these poles are actually radiative poles. And so it depends on the spin of the field which you consider which, which, which pole, which multipole will radiate. And so what I was telling you yesterday, and just take it for granted, that the scalar field, uh, which is spin zero, of course, already radiates in the monopole approximation. The electromagnetism, the electromagnetism radiates for the dipole, and that's spin one. And finally, the gravitational field uh, will radiate only the first, first multipole, which radiates is the quadrupole. So that's gravity. Um, and you know, so typically, this multipole expansion, you know, the higher poles you go, of course, the signal is weaker. And so this is also the reason why electromagnetic waves are much easier to actually detect than the gravitational waves because this is actually a much, much weaker signal. OK, so now what I would like to do is to actually estimate how much energy is lost uh, you know, in these violent events. So for example, you have the black hole collision or whatever. You have the binary star, which is, which is gradually merging, and so on. So how much energy the system is, uh, is losing? So energy. And there was a question to Lewis on this as well. Energy loss. Uh, due to gravitational waves. And 
so you, so from what I told you uh, a couple lectures ago, you immediately run into a problem when you try. So of course, for this, I need to understand what is the corresponding energy momentum tensor for the gravitational field. Okay, and so energy momentum tensor, energy momentum tensor for gravitational field. And so simply by doing the analogy with the electromagnetism, so I was arguing is that, well, in the case of electromagnetism, I start with the field phi, then to, to write down the intensity, electric intensity, I just take gradient of phi, and then I know that the energy density is proportional to E square, so it's gradient phi square. So similarly, you can argue that the energy density here should be proportional to uh, a gradient of the metric, and now square, or of course, this is some, something like gamma square, uh, which are our Christopher symbols. But you know, you of course immediately see that there is a problem. If you go to the freely falling system, uh, this kind of energy will be zero, okay? So this is, um, first of all, this is not a tensor. So now I can write down a tensor which has these gamma squares in it, uh, but it, uh, this will not be really a tensor, not a tensor. And so there is nothing you can actually write down, which would be uh, an energy momentum tensor for gravitational field. Um, but just notice that if it is really given in terms of the gamma squares, so, so the Christopher symbols are not a tensor with respect to the general coordinate transformation, but they behave as a tensor with respect to the Lorentz transformation. So actually this thing should be well defined uh, if you are just taking a perturbation of the flat space and allow only such transformations, which are linear coordinate transformations for the Lorentz transformations. Uh, but it is, it is with respect to Lorentz transformations. And so, you know, it actually tells you that maybe an object like this actually could be useful especially in this weak field approximation where we have a perturbation of the flat metric and we treat gravitational field as a field living, living in the flat space time. So maybe I can, you know, in this, at least in this case, I can assign to this some kind of energy momentum tensor. And this hopefully describes, uh, you know, how much energy is carried by the gravitational wave. Um, okay, so now this was the idea. Um, and so because this is not a tensor, uh, pe people call it gravitational a uh, pseudo tensor, okay? So, so, so this is not a tensor, so they call it pseudo tensor. So now there's many, many ways how you can construct this object, and each way gives you a different object. So there's many, many uh, pseudo tensors for gravitational field. Uh, if you have some reasonable... Uh, Prescription for this, this will be named after you. So there's Landau Lifshitz pseudo tensor, but there are many other uh, pseudo tensors you can write down for the gravitational field. Uh, and as I said, the answer is not unique, but they should, they should carry the same information. So if you actually calculate how much energy is stored, like the total energy in the gravitational radiation, the answer better be uh, the same for each of these tensors. Sometimes it is, sometimes it is not. Okay, so, so anyway, so we have this thing here. Um, and so people studied this. So the first person who actually came with the right answer is actually Landau. Um, and that was probably in the 40s already. Uh, but of course, he was in Russia, and so people didn't really pay attention. Um, and so there was this conference in the 60s uh, in the US where actually also Feynman, uh, Feynman went to. And so, so people were discussing really, you know, can I form an energy momentum tensor for the gravitational field, or, you know, uh, and then he got really depressed and he wrote many letters how horrible these people doing gravity are because they don't understand anything. They don't answer the basic question, can gravitational waves actually do any work? Okay, and so you can read it about, you know, read about this in his, uh, surely you must be joking, how depressed he was uh, at, this, at this conference. Okay, so here is the answer. Uh, so I think the, the, the most, Conceptually simple one 
is the Landau's prescription. So Landau. Uh, and so, so it's, it's called Landau Lifshitz Pseudotensor. So Landau Lifshitz uh, Pseudotensor. Um, and the idea is very, very simple. So you know that uh, we have the Bianchi identity. Lava mu g mu nu equals to zero. OK, this must be true, provided the Einstein equations are satisfied. Um, and you know this is not a conservation law, because you have the covariant derivative here. And this is a symmetric object, so it doesn't define any conservation law. However, if I can, if I can transform this covariant derivative to a partial derivative one, then this will define a conservation law. So how to do it? Well, how do we transform a covariant derivative to a partial one? Anybody? We just switch off the gammas, right? <laughs> so in freely falling frame, freely falling frame, uh, gammas are equal to zero. And so that means that we have g mu, g mu nu equals to zero. OK, so in that, you know, so I, I go to a freely falling system. I use my equivalence principle. And then this must be true, because gamma star is 0. All right. So now, let's try to satisfy this identically. So you want to satisfy, so want uh, to satisfy this identically. And to that purpose, we say, OK, let's write this d mu g mu nu as a divergence of a superpotential. So, so we introduce, we introduce a superpotential. Let's call it S. S Kappa mu nu. So now it's an it's an object with three indices such that uh, d so that so such that this object is anti-symmetric in the first two indices. So it's anti-symmetric in kappa and mu, but it's also symmetric in mu and nu. Okay, and then we require that d kappa as kappa mu nu equals to uh, my g mu nu. Okay, so why do we satisfy this identically? So this is a definition, if you want, of this of this superpotential. This is how we define it. Um, but obviously, if I now take a partial derivative with respect to mu, right? So then I have partial mu, partial kappa, and then this is anti-symmetric by definition in kappa and mu, and so that's zero. Okay, so then uh, g mu g mu nu is equal to zero identically. All right, so we define the superpotential. And of course, you can calculate it from here, right? So, so you know what g mu nu is. You just write down g mu nu in a freely falling frame. And then you are asking, can I actually you know, massage it so that it's written in this form? Uh, and yes, you can. And you can read off what this s kappa mu nu is. So, can actually uh, construct construct explicitly so remember that Jimmy nu is something some expression which is you know two derivatives of the metric the first derivatives of the metric and the metric itself of course now I'm in the freely falling frame so the first derivatives of the metric are gone and so whatever is left has just two derivatives of the metric and so then you can just take that expression and you can see that it can be written as this. And you can read off what this s kappa mu nu is. OK, so you can really construct it explicitly. And it's ugly, but whatever. OK, so now go back uh, to any frame. OK, so now we are no longer in the freely falling frame. And we, ju we just, you know, 
So this is under the assumption that the first derivatives of the metric vanish. So now I just take the difference of the two things, and they will depend on the first derivatives of the metric. Okay, so now in any frame, you simply take d kappa s kappa mu nu, which you know what it is, and then take now g mu nu out. But now this thing will depend on the first derivatives of the metric, because now I am in any frame, and I'm not setting them equal to 0. And you simply define this to be 8 pi g tau mu nu, where this tau mu nu, well, has to be symmetric, because this guy is symmetric in mu nu, this guy is symmetric in mu nu. Um, and you call this, but again, it's a definition, and there's the landau lifshitz pseudo tensor. All right, so what is this good for? Uh, the statement is that once you have this pseudo tensor, that really captures sort of gravitational of the uh, of the gravitational field, the, the energy of the gravitational field. And how do I see that? Well, let's look at what happens. So I can also write this. I can also write. I can also write this uh, using the Einstein equations as well. I just put g mu on the right hand side. So I'll have d kappa s kappa mu nu which is something fixed, equals to, well, g mu nu plus 8 pi g tau mu nu. But g mu nu, I use just the Einstein equation. So this is 8 pi g, 8 pi g, and then t mu nu, which is the uh, energy momentum tensor for the matter, uh, plus tau mu nu. Okay, so this is, I'm just rewriting this using the Einstein equation. Uh, but look at this beauty. What happens if I apply partial mu on this? Right? So if I apply d mu d kappa on s kappa mu nu, what do I get? Zero. And that means that also this guy plus tau mu nu uh, mu goes to zero. In other words, now we have a conservation law. And that the conservation law consists of, it's a conservation law for an energy momentum tensor of the matter plus this pseudo tensor for the gravitational field. So that actually tells you that a total energy, total energy of matter plus gravity is conserved. And so you see that really this object tau mu nu allows you to find a conservation law, and, and that's why it has to actually capture the energy momentum tensor of, of the gravitational field. Isn't this a beautiful idea? Like so, and this was already known in the 40s, but as I said, people didn't know it, and then, then they had this conference and then discussing what the, what the hell the energy could be. Um, and yeah. But, but you know, in the 60s, there was a golden age of general relativity. People actually figured it out uh, using different techniques. And, and one of the techniques I give you is actually in the text. So let me just look at that. So um, different construction. Construction. Uh, Okay, and that's very simple. So we, so if you just forget about how we constructed this, and of course, you know, this can be written explicitly down, and it's precisely written in terms of gamma squares. Okay, so it's gamma gamma, so that you have two indices left, and then stuff like that. So now, let's say I don't have this construction, and I just know that I want to construct something which, which is like partial g square. Okay, I want to construct something which is, uh, you know, it is quadratic in the metric, and has its derivatives of the metric. Um, and so the idea is that, that you have your vacuum Einstein equation, g mu nu equals to zero, and you want to solve this, solve this perturbatively, really order 
by order uh, in metric perturbations. That means that I'm setting my metric g mu nu to be uh, in the zero order approximation, it will be eta mu nu. In the next approximation, I'll have h mu nu, which is of the order of epsilon, if you want. And then in the next, I'll have h mu nu 2, which is of the order of epsilon square, and so on. And then plus uh, o epsilon cube. So, so this is what you are doing. Okay, so now I take my g mu nu equals to zero. So I, I calculate what my g mu nu is for these perturbations here. Okay, so in the zeros order, I just evaluate g mu nu on eta. What do I get? The zero order g mu nu evaluated on the metric eta. Zero. So zeros order order is g mu nu evaluated on eta is automatically zero, so we are not getting anything interesting. The first order, so we are evaluating g mu nu, g mu nu on eta plus h. Okay, so that will be g mu nu of eta plus uh, g mu nu on h. So this is g mu nu, and let's call it linear, uh, acting on h plus uh, o epsilon square. Okay, so this is what we are getting. And so then this is precisely what we were doing when we linearized gravity, right? So we just found for the first perturbation, we just did eta mu nu plus h, and then we found you know, the linear contribution in h, and then the Einstein equation. So then the Einstein equation. And this order is simply g mu nu l from h equals to zero, and it determi uh, determines what h mu nu perturbation is. Right? If we can solve this, we can find h mu nu. But you also have, by the way, we also have the Bianchi identity, so d mu g mu nu l equals to zero because that's the consequence of the full Bianchi identity, but now at the linearized level, uh, I just, you know, g mu nu is already small, so I, I throw away the gamma terms, and this must be true. Okay, so this is what happens in the first order, and this is what we have done in the linearized theory, right? So now, the funny thing is to go to the second order, second order, um, and so then I include both. I include eta, h, and sort of like epsilon square h. Okay, so I have that. And so now I have to evaluate my g mu nu uh, on eta plus h plus pi order perturbation h. All right, so again, the, the first order g mu nu acting on h is zero. Uh, and then I have g mu nu, g mu nu linear acting on h, which we dealt with in the previous order. And then I'll have g mu nu linear acting on h square. And then I will have g mu nu quadratic acting on h plus o epsilon cube. Okay, so this is what I get. Um, so I'll have something which is like linear order in terms of h square, sort of. And then I have quadratic order in terms of h. And this is what it is. Okay, so now we know from the first case that this is equal to zero because we already solved it here. We already know what h mu nu is. Okay. And so by in imposing the vacuum Einstein equations, we are simply learning that g mu nu, so this whole g mu nu equals to zero to our perturbatic order. So now this is what we are doing when we impose the Einstein equations. And what it gives you is that g mu nu linear uh, of h square is equal to 8 pi g tau mu nu 
tau tilde mu nu, where tau tilde mu nu is this term here. So it's minus 1 over 8 pi g, uh, g mu nu quadratic image. All right, so, you know, so all I'm doing is that I'm writing the Einstein equation, this is equal to zero. This I already know that it's equal to zero from the, from the, okay, this is not good. Let's write it here. This is equal to zero from the previous. And then we have this term plus that term equal, uh, has to be equal to zero. So I just put this term on the left-hand side and this term on the right-hand side and call it tau mu nu tilde, okay? So by the way, notice that because I know what h mu nu is, uh, if I know, you know what, what this characteristic is, I can just calculate the right-hand side, something given to you, and you are just solving the Einstein equation for the second order perturbation in the metric, okay? And well, this is it. So the last thing which you have to do is that this g mu nu quadratic in H is simply to take g mu nu and evaluate it on the perturbation H. But now instead of going to the linear order, you go to the quadratic order. So whatever you, you are doing in your homework to the linear order, now you do to a quadratic order. And, and this is precisely what this guy is. Okay? And this actually gives you a different prescription. So again, you call this an energy momentum pseudo tensor. I call it tau tilde because tau tilde is different from the Landau Lifshitz pseudo tensor, uh, but typically gives the same results for the energy and stuff like that. So now, if you do this explicitly, so t tau mu nu equals to 1 over 32 pi g. The expression for this tau is actually much simpler. So that's why people do it. And then if you integrate by parts things, which is, I'll, I'll explain that. This is what you get, d nu h rho sigma, and then minus one half d mu of h, d nu of h uh, minus d rho h rho sigma, and then d mu h nu sigma and minus d rho h rho uh, sigma if i have too many terms uh one two three four that's fine h rho sigma d nu h mu sigma okay so this is the prescription for time mu nu you see that you know it's a little bit ugly but it's actually 100 times better than the landau lifshitz uh, which is really, really long. Um, so what we have done here is that there are these strange brackets here. So they stand for space-time coarse graining. So this corresponds to space-time uh, coarse graining. So from a theoretical point of view, this is very convenient because you know that you cannot localize the energy at a point. But if I take some region, because I can always go to a freely falling system, but if I take just some region around it uh, and average over that, that region, I cannot get rid of the gravitational energy component. So, so that's, you know, from a theoretical point of view. From a practical point of view, what you are really doing is that you are simply allowing to... So this is some kind of space integral over space-time, uh, so we can integrate by parts. So whenever you see a derivative of this guy here, I can actually shift the derivative on this guy, uh, and that's, that's how you simplify the, the relation. So anyway, in the transfer traceless gauge, TT gauge, um, what it means is that H0, H0 and D mu, H mu rho is zero. So you see that this time is gone, that time is gone, and that time is gone, and so it's only this time left. And so you have beautiful expression for tau mu nu, which is just d mu h rho sigma, d nu h rho sigma. But this will be only true if you use the transverse traceless gauge. All right, so that's the theory part. Um, and so the last thing is to calculate. So now we have t mu nu for the gravitational field, yes? So you see different energies in different gauge. Uh... 
depending on the gauge selection? Uh, no, I'm saying just, you know, so if, if I use the transfer stresses gauge, I don't have to write these terms here. Uh, but of course, the total energy shouldn't depend on what kind of gauge I'm using. Yeah. If <laughs> it shouldn't, right? Um, all right, so we have the energy momentum tensor for the gravitational field, which is really, really the difficult part to obtain. And then once you, ha once you have that, you can just calculate the power irradiated by the system. So how much energy is emitted uh, per time? Um, and of course, this is just given. So, so this energy momentum tensor has exactly the same structure as any energy momentum tensor with energy density here and then energy flux is zero, zero y component. So what you have to do is that really you integrate over the sphere at infinity and then tau zero mu or tau zero i if you are, um, and then r square and mu and over some angles. Um, very good. So we know what tau mu nu is, tau mu nu tilde. Uh, so we can integrate this, provided we know the metric, but we calculated the metric yesterday. I shown you that from an isolated system, you have this beautiful quadrupole formula for how to find the metric. Okay, so now use quadrupole formula. Formula, and that gives you, you know, the perturbation at infinity from the isolated source. And then I'm skipping several pages here, uh, which are quite nasty and whatever. Uh, but then you get a beautiful formula that this is P, and this is G over 5 C5, and then <sighs> QIJ, QIJ, one, two, three dots on that, and then QIJ, one, two, three dots on that. And that's the power radiated by an isolated system. This is also called quadrupole formula uh, to confuse you more. So one quadrupole formula tells you how the metric looks like far away from the isolated source. And this is a power, uh, power uh, quadrupole formula, which tells you how much energy per time is radiated by the system. And so this QIJ, is just traceless part of our quadrupole moment. So we had yesterday the quadrupole moment I, 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 J, and so now I take the traceless part of that. Um, minus one, three, delta I, J, delta K, L, I, K, L. So you, you just, you know, when you calculate uh, the quadrupole moment for an object or for a system I, then you just subtract the trace of that. That's a traceless quadrupole moment. Um, and so that's the one which enters the power formula. Okay? Uh, and it just comes out, you know, using the, doing the actual calculation. So here, many, many steps. Uh, as I said, several pages. If you want to see all the bloody details, they are in Carl's book. Um, but, but this is the important result. So all I have to do is to calculate the quadrupole moment take three derivatives of that and square it, and this gives me the power how much energy is lost by the system. So, of course, I can do uh, lumberjack mathematics, and so I can say, well, the quadrupole system, well, what it is is energy density times xx, so, so the quadrupole moment, something is like m l square if the uh, system has size l, and mass m. Uh, and of course, now each dot of this will bring some omega, so some frequency. So if, the, if I have system inspiring with the frequency omega, um, then I have, you know, each dot brings me an omega. And so then you can estimate the power is simply uh, given by omega to the six because I have three derivatives and three derivatives. So it'll be g. Uh, over C5 and then omega to power 6 um, and then quadrupole square, which is okay, uh, already G, M square L to the 4. Okay, and so this is how you estimate the power radiated by a system. 
So now let's say I have a rod, uh, which is one meter long, uh, and it's rotating with the frequency one hertz. The question is how much energy is radiated in gravitational waves, uh, and it's actually not much. Um, so for a rod, so for a rod of one meter long and one hertz, this is 10 to minus 52 watts, so not much. Uh, then you can con consider a Jupiter going around the sun. So Jupiter, um, and so you know it's going with some frequency and it has some distance uh, from the sun, and you find that it's five kilowatts, which is still not very much. But then you go to the binary system which Louis was talking about. And so there was this binary pulsar, binary pulsar, and it was, it has the period of something like eight hours. So you have, you know, the stars which are well, and it was just eight hours the, the orbital period, and then they were really really massive things. And so for this thing, you find that it's ten to the forty-eight uh, watts. Okay, and so. This thing, of course, as the system is doing this thing here, it gradiates the gravitational waves. So actually, it's going closer and closer. It's merging, and as it's merging, it's actually going faster and faster. And so you can see actually the change of the period, uh, how how long it takes for the pulsations to uh, to arrive. And this was measured, and it was like the most precise measurement of anything at the time. Uh, including all quantum electrodynamics things and so whatever. So it was the most precise thing in those days, and it was 1974, and it was by Hals and Taylor. Hals and Taylor. Um, Taylor. And of course, they got a Nobel Prize for this. Okay, so, so they measured how the period is changing, and then they you know, predicted how much energy the system is actually losing, and then this precisely matches with the energy losing uh, loss by this quadrupole formula here. Okay, so that was first Nobel Prize for general relativity, and then of course now we have another one for the, the Dirac observation of gravitational waves, uh, as Louis was talking about. Are there any questions? Is are uh, there what uh, Landau and Lipschitz did, um, they don't use that you're uh, perturbing over. Uh, uh, it's no perturbations here, yeah. So that one is like. And you get the same, well, you get the same results when you are uh, doing, around, doing it around. E e even if you do around that space, you get different results. Um, the energy momentum tensors typically differ by a divergence of another superpotential. So I can always, you know, add something which is a total divergence of something, mm -hmm. and and so so I can have different ex expressions. So even on, even on the perturbations around flat space, they don't agree, uh, but but they give you the same energy. If you if you integrate these things over the space time over some spatial slice, they give you the same energy, or you know they they, they give you the same prediction for the power. But you need to integrate, uh, like in uh, from. Like when you look at it from infinity or something. Yeah, yeah. So, so certainly the quadrupole formula uh, is the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so the the explicit expressions for the, the energy momentum tensor tensors are different, but 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 they should give the same same physical result. Other questions? All right. So tomorrow we start black holes. <laughs>